Let us take a step back and dig deep into what's dividing America. Republican strategist Frank Luntz has been uh, gauging the nation's political polarization for decades. Once described as the Nostradamus of pollsters, he's best known for pioneering political focus groups. He says these conversations are a painful wake-up call now to the toxicity of the red versus blue rhetoric. He tells our Walter Isaacson that he's given up hope of a really united America. Frank, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Why are we so polarized now? It's because we speak to be heard rather than speaking to learn or listening to learn. I think that for so many people for so long, they had no voice. That the elites, people like you and me, we had a place where we could put out our information, television, newspapers, media, anywhere. But th there's the vast majority of Americans wanted to be heard. They were frustrated. They felt forgotten and left behind. And with the current political environment, they now have the chance to be heard. The problem is we're not learning anything. We're not growing. We're not seeing life in, in all its greatness. All we are doing is finding ways to demonize each other or worse, dehumanize each other or to me the worst of all, which is to denounce each other, the, the D words. And we're all doing it on the right, on the left, in the media, in culture and entertainment. Anytime you put a camera in front of you, watch the language that's being used. And it is so ugly and so polarizing. And I'll tell you now, because you and I have known each other for a while, not only has it never been this bad, but the America that you knew and the America that you celebrated and the great books that you wrote and of these great people, that's not the country we are right now. And it's not, it is not that we're heading in that direction. Walter, I'm telling you, we're here. If you heard what I hear, if you went to these sessions that I moderate and listen to people unedited, unfettered, it makes you want to cry. You've watched people just erupt against each other. In fact, can we show a clip? Uh, right. Yeah, let's go. Right there's the problem. No, it's not. Right, no, right there. Your attitude is the problem. My attitude? Yes. I don't want somebody telling me that my schools have to have prayer, the schools have to have prayer in school. Right. I didn't say that. They did not before. I didn't say that. will always be prayer in school. All I said was God chooses the color of our skin. That's all I said. Now, if, if you don't said, believe that, you don't then believe? who's making the choice? What, what if you don't believe in God? Who's making the calls? Don't believe in God. That's your choice. And, and we everybody don't care. An American yes, you do, because right? you try and force it on everybody else. No. no. You're, yeah. you're making a lot of gross assumptions. I'm not making yeah. gross assumptions. You I'm are making at gross my assumptions. Pence. I'm looking They're at Mike Pence, who signed anti-LGBT in Indiana. So what? I rest my case. It all comes down to listening to what the other person has to say. Yeah. Open up your ears and not your mouth and listen to what other people have to say, then weigh what's going on. What They're all think? liars. They what all lie. Okay, then what do you think? Everybody the says of about the Trump States. being aggressive and, and brutal and, and all this stuff. But you support How condescending was Obama? But you I couldn't stand to watch that guy. He just looked down on top of everybody. Trump will get down in the dirt and work with you. So Obama you, you would you never have done that. You want respect, but you have a president <laughs> who takes on women, Minorities, everything but white you know males. He won the he election, and he, he won. He didn't get and you guys can't vote. handle that. He didn't. To stop. Yeah, my parents, when I was a kid, I used to hear in Hebrew school sheket pavakasha, which is basically shut up <laughs> and listen. Don't disrupt the class. You saw that. Mm -hmm. You saw the anger. And those aren't kids. Those aren't young adults. They're people older than us. These are people in their 70s. And if they behave that way, then don't you think that people in the 40s are going to follow them and people in their teens are going to follow those? My God. But do you think that focus groups and the micro-targeting and whatever have helped, and you've been in the lead of that, have helped polarize our society? The purpose of the focus groups is to bring attention to how people think and feel, is to give them a voice for three hours and to put them on television. I know you got another one there. And the one you're about to pull up is one of the coolest of all. I respect everybody's point of view, but not to get into arguments. I usually like to stay with people who have more or less the same point of view as I do. <laughs> and is that healthy, though? Yes. In 2018, it is. Because any time 
I disagree with somebody, I notice that they make enemies with me. They don't talk to me anymore. It's not me not talking to them. That's a first generation, that, that whole group were first generation immigrants from countries all across the globe. And they were the most hopeful and they were the most optimistic. And they, if they were right here, right now, and I'd love to bring their opinions to your viewers, mm -hmm. they would tell you that America is still a great country, that America still offers the opportunity and the hope and the dreams of, of change and improvement, of making a better life, that it's still there. And they would criticize all the meanness and, and bitterness that people have. But you only get that from an outsider. You don't get that if this is how you've grown up. You, you compare the way we are today to the way we were 20 or 30 years ago. So to finish your point, because it's a fair point, I thought that the purpose of these focus groups and dial sessions was to explain the anger, was to explain the frustration. What it ended up doing, unfortunately, tragically, is feeding it. When they see people behaving that way on television, they start to behave that way themselves. And, and I hate that. What about the media and the filter bubble we have where we're all going to our corner of the blogosphere or our end of the talk radio dial or our cable news channel? So in the studies that I've done, I've realized, and this is really tragic, that we now get our news to affirm us rather than inform us. If you tell me you read the Wall Street Journal first, I'm going to assume that you're on the right side of the spectrum. If you read the New York Times first, I'm going to assume that you're on the left side. And I'm going to be right 70 or 75% of the time. There are liberals who read the journal. There are conservatives who read the Times. But we're not crossing paths anymore. We're not collecting the same information any, anymore. CNN, very few Republicans watch CNN. Very few Democrats watch Fox. It shouldn't be that way. And the more polarized our media, the more likely that the public itself becomes more polarized. Do you think perhaps this polarized discourse is because the stakes are very high and there's a reason people are mad? That's the excuse I've gotten. But we always had a way. Look, we had this in 18, let's say 1848 to 1859, and we know what happened in this country, and so many people died. We had the same thing globally in 1936 to 1939. They didn't figure it out and tens of millions of people died. The stakes are no less high now than they were in 1860, than they were in 1939, and I know how it works out. Because I read too much, because I learn too much, I know what happens. I've read the end of the book. When you read the end, when you, re when you read the end of 1984, what, is, what has he done? He's given up. That's how he lived. He gave up. I don't know. I, t I wasn't raised. I don't know any other way but to fight it. And I'm so tired now. Come with me. Just come to these groups. Listen to Americans. And it's painful now. It really is. But, you know, we came through 1939. We came through 1968. Your family We did. came through... Your family, the Civil War. Bobby Kennedy did not, Martin Luther King did not. How many people were killed in 19... It was the worst year of our time, and I think 2020 could be 1968 all over again. But America's political system has always, so far, had a gyroscope. So far. And righted itself. Is Britain still the great power it was? Is France still the great power? Portugal used to have the most incredible navy. It's meaningless today, with all due respect to the Portuguese. Russia had this most amazing empire that's come and gone. How many empires, the Egyptians, the Romans, how many empires have come and gone? And I really don't want to be around to see the end of mine. You talk about some of the really tough times. And one of the things that happened in each time was the emergence of a new movement. Sometimes a new party, sometimes whether it be Teddy Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln or in some ways, the New Deal coalition comes up. Do you think there can be a realignment or even a third party in American politics that says, we're about to go off a cliff, let's get sensible? Uh, you just described Howard Schultz. This is a guy who grew up in abject poverty, who grew up hungry. You'd think he'd be a hero of the Democratic Party, that he struggled, he succeeded, and then he gave that success to others. He gave his people health care long before Walmart ever did. He gave his people 
the ability to buy into the company long before most Wall Street companies ever did. He, he's now providing an education benefit before anyone is. He gave back, and he was decimated by them. How are you supposed to challenge this when the very people who should be applauding your success are the ones yelling at you? In America, it was never evil to be successful as long as you gave back to your community. And now you have kids who scream and protest at him. You billionaire, go back to Davos. This man has done more for the people who work for him than any other employer. And he is a billionaire. And he is successful and he's given back. And yet he has screamed at wherever he goes. He's protested. No, I have no faith. Because someone like that should have that capability. There are people in the Democratic Party. Uh, Mitch Landrieu, one of the best mayors ever in this country. I'm praying that he runs for office because at the same token, he takes down the Confederate statues because they are offensive. And he says to the teachers unions, you have failed our education system. We're going to turn into charter schools. People like Michael Bennett, who's, I don't know whether he runs. He's willing to challenge the president's budget, Obama's budget, because it contributed too much to the deficit, to the debt, at the very moment that he's chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. These are people with the guts. Tim Scott from South Carolina, who has a heart as big as his entire studio and cannot say a negative word because he thinks it's wrong. It is not, not just part of him, but it's not who he believes we should be. Or Ben Sass, who has an intellectual approach. There are amazing people out there, but I think the system will break all of them. But let me ask you, suppose you had a pragmatic Democrat, one who said, I'm going to try to work and get things done. Take a Mitch Landrieu, take a Michael Bennett, two you've mentioned. How would you have them run? Could they possibly win? We actually had one. His name is John McCain, and he wanted to choose Joe, uh, uh, Joe Lieberman. What an amazing thing that would have been, McCain-Lieberman. And you know what happened. You may have even written about what happened. McCain was destroyed. They told him, it will block your nomination if you do this. Well, we are even more hyped up. We are even more partisan today. And you can't wish, I, I wish for them to have the courage of their convictions, but I do not wish them to destroy their lives. It's not right for us to push them into that. You've been so pessimistic. First of all, why don't you then just walk away from it all? Or secondly, could you find a new purpose and how you could direct your political talent yeah. to do something different? I have a purpose, and it is the next generation. I'm teaching at NYU Abu Dhabi. Not NYU, but NYU Abu Dhabi, the most global campus on the face of the earth. I'm taking 17 students on a 10-day trip to London, Paris, and Brussels at a, the exact moment of Brexit. Last year, I took them to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Washington, and New York and introduced them to conflicts in America. The only hope that I have, the reason why I do keep going, is because that campus it's the most global on the face of the earth. And every day they solve problems. Every day they address conflicts. The Russian student's best friend is Ukrainian and their roommates. You have Jewish students who have close relationships with Palestinians and other Arabs. You have Chinese students who are close, incredible friends with countries that they have invaded in my lifetime. That's the solution. Our only hope, our only hope, is that we teach children to love, not hate, is that we teach them not tolerance, because that's the lowest level, that we teach them respect and civility and decency, and that we do it not just in America, but on a global scale. If we can wring out this hate in that generation, this world survives and America prospers. Frank, thank you for being with us. I, I apologize, but thank you for having me. <laughs>